Okay, we will get started with today's lecture. Welcome to week 10. Today we're going to be talking about some special topics and accessibility. Um, yeah, so we're going to like do a little final reminder and then talk about some other like Figma topics like illustrations, games, activities, etc. Um, and then we're going to like revisit accessibility and talk about like accessibility in design and universal design. This is the attendance form as per usual. So type this in. Are we are we good? Okay. Uh, this is also the slide deck link. We don't have any demos today, unfortunately, but you can still follow along and like um see the slides more in depth if you would like. <clears throat> Yeah, so just like a reminder about the final project, um, you should like have an idea of what you're going to do and reminder that proposals are due today. Um, and this is mandatory. So we just want to like get your idea of like what you're going to do. So you kind of have like a starting point. Um, and yeah, the goal of this final is like for you to discover something that you're interested in making um, and like seeing your vision go all the way through and using the stuff you've learned from this class. And you also get like um, feedback in your lab section and stuff. So yeah. So this week um, for your lab, you'll have like course feedback. And then um, the week after you'll have like critique session. Like, so before you turn in your final, you can get like feedback um, from your lab group. And reminder that the midpoint check-in is due a week from today, um, next Thursday, the 18th by end of the day. So that's kind of just like, um, you know, have like some lo-fi sketches or a little more fleshed out version of your proposal. Um, and then for the submission for the final project, uh, this is like both the Figma file and there's also a form. Um, so like our last lecture is basically a showcase where you can like present your, um, your final project. And it's like very casual. It's just like two, three minutes, just like kind of talk about what you did, what you're inspired by, stuff like that. So please, please fill it out. We'd love to have like as many people present as we can. Um, yeah. And then you also have a write up, which is like 300 words max, so not too long. Um, and then submit this as a PDF in addition to the file and the form. And this is due on Wednesday, April 24th by midnight, which is the night before the last lecture. So this is on Wednesday. Yeah. Final presentations, please submit it. Okay. Uh, any questions about the final logistics? No? Cool. <clears throat> also, we have no lecture next week. Um, yeah. So take a break and take this time to work on your final. And um, yeah, enjoy the last moments of the semester. But yeah, please don't come to this room next week. We will not be here. Um, yeah. So like what we're going to be talking about, special topics, special topics is kind of like an overview of like um, kind of the more full scope of Figma as like a community um, and software. So yeah, there's just like so much that we haven't talked about. Um, and like some examples, like you can make different interactive games. Um, you can like, like make mockups or even like just templates for like resumes and stuff. So to start off, we'll talk about illustrations. And um, yeah, we're just kind of showing like some examples for these. But this is like a paper dolls uh, Figma file that someone made. It looks like, you know, you can like move them around like the paper dolls. This is like a like travel vignette um, kind of like graphic file that they have like different places that you can like gain graphics from. Animated anchors like kind of guides you in um, the more animation style of prototyping. So like um, it kind of teaches you how to like recreate anchors with prototyping and like, so you can like animate someone's arm moving and stuff like that. And then um, this is another file called i.club. This is actually a club that I was in like freshman year at Berkeley. And they did like, um, like design education for high schools and stuff, but they have like some really cool assets and stuff. And they made this like little video game looking thing. Um, moving on to like games in Figma. Mm -hmm. So this is like, a game table and dice uh, file where you can just like roll dice and make it look cool in Figma. 
Um, there's also Figopoly, which is like Monopoly, but in Figma. Um, I highly recommend you check out these because I don't know the full scope of full scope of everything. So check it out if you're interested in any of these. Um, and then you can also play Uno. Someone like redesigned the game inside Figma. Um, you can do like a uh, like a words with friends type of thing, multiplayer words. Yeah, but that's like there's so many cool games, and I feel like you'd never expect to be able to make make games in Figma because it's like you know, sounds like a UI UX design software, but um, there's like limitless things you can do and like just do things for fun. Um, there's also like a resume template thing that someone made and there's a lot of other templates that you can find, but this is just like for a resume um, and it uses like auto layout to, you know, make things very straight and uh, yeah. So activities, what are these? These are like kind of like games, I guess, but someone made like a holiday activities file. So maybe you want to do some fun family games over the holidays and um, it's a great place to find some. Um, this is also Would You Rather with some food things. Very interesting. The Mystery of Everson Manor. It's like an escape room adventure. That's one made. So yeah, very interesting. Actually, the creator of this class made this. So yeah very fancy but yeah let things be chaotic have fun like you don't have to make everything pixel perfect when you're designing figma you can just like have fun with it and like make goofy little things and yeah um, um, um there's also like slide deck templates this is one that we created like from our decal so it's like makes it easier to build decks um with like different layout options and stuff like that and also uses like grids um this is like a cheat sheet study guide template thing yes uh this is also a a meme like template file so have at it but we will be moving on to talking about like accessibility and um yeah things that pertain to accessible design so um accessible design and inclusive design tend to focus like on the intent, like during your design process rather than just the end product. And yeah, one thing like that's made a main part of accessible design is like web content accessibility guidelines. Um, this is like developed by the web accessibility initiative, I guess, in order to like make everything on the web more accessible to different kinds of people. Um, so some of these are like um, making things more accessible for people who are hard of hearing or have like um, vision issues and stuff like that um, or like dyslexia stuff like that and yeah uh, these guidelines are like considered to be a standard in web design so like if you were to go in that field you would definitely get comfortable with these guidelines and like implement them into your thinking of designing and stuff um, yeah one thing like we talked about before is like color contrast um, so this like impacts readability and especially people with like colorblindness or people who are um, have like a tr hard time seeing contrast. Um, yeah, like one of the guidelines is maintaining like the minimum contrast ratio of four to five to one for text. So this is like just making sure that the text on top of like whatever color is behind it is very easy to read and see. This is like an example of um, doing like this test on some different typefaces and colors so like on the top one on the normal text it's like kind of thin hard to read and it fails like both the guideline tests and then the second one um it's like a bit bolder and bigger so like it passes one of the tests and then the last one has like a highlight and then the text is like black against white in the highlight and this passes the final test because it's very easy to read um, but also keep in mind color, like don't solely rely on colors to convey information while it is like a good way. Sometimes um, you don't necessarily know what that color is or people are colorblind. So that's like an obstacle. Um, so like uh, a different way to convey different types of information is to use the different like patterns or labels um, or like just different kinds of contrast that you can incorporate. So yeah, it's an example. And this kind of like idea is really important when you're making like forms 
um, or like buttons and stuff because in a form you have to fill out like a lot of different things. So you have to know like where you're supposed to type, where you're supposed to like check things. So yeah, this is like an example of a text box. It's kind of like hard to see like the first name, last name when it's like in gray against the white. So like changing it to make it more high contrast is like a lot easier for everyone to understand and read. Um, it's also important to provide non-visual forms of information. So this is like things like speech to text features um, or text to speech. And yeah, users who are like deaf or hard of hearing can benefit from having captions or transcriptions on videos and stuff like that. Um, yeah. A lot of like newspapers and magazines also offer like audio versions of their articles as we come into more of a technologically advanced society. Um, yeah, like, so here's an example of like New York Times. They have like an article, but they also have like a little uh, audio player at the top. And then there's also a lot of SoundCloud recordings of articles from the Atlantic. So yeah, many different forms to access the same information for different types of people. There's also like alternative text and image description. Um, so alt text kind of like tells you the most vital information about a like an image um, and they're like really short just like one or two sentences and um, usually like on a lot of websites and stuff you can like hover over like an image or something and then you'll see the alt text um, so like if you don't really understand what it is then you can like very clearly be said what it is um, and then image descriptions are kind of like a longer form of this um, in like more detailed so like in this example, actually, in this example, we have like a picture of a cute little cat and like the alt text is just like the bare bones, like a gray tabby cat with green eyes lying on a window perch. Um, so it just gives you like the concrete information, like, okay, what is it? And then image description kind of goes like more in depth. It's like a gray tabby cat with green eyes lying on a pink and gray scarf on a window perch. The sky outside of the window is bright and blue and the cat is looking over the side of the perch with his paws crossed like very very in-depth but it just makes it like very clear um yeah hierarchy and organization is also a very important tool when designing like most anything um especially when you're like trying to con convey or tell people like certain information hierarchy like kind of guides a reader um and like poor organization really makes it difficult to follow and it makes you angry looking at it so don't do that but yeah have like clear and simple organization that easily guides someone through your design. Um, and generally like left aligned text is like better and more intuitive for everyone, at least in America, uh, to like understand and classify hierarchy. So now we will talk about accessibility and inclusivity in design. Um, so we'll just go over like some case studies um, yeah, but accessible accessibility features um, can be incorporated into like many different designs and areas of interest and platforms and media types. So like gaming, film, web, tech. Remapping is um, something that like a lot of controllers use. So it refers to like allowing players to change the in-game function of keys or buttons on the controller. Um, so kind of like customizing what buttons do what and yeah, while this feature like allows for people to change their controller to best suit their desires, it's also important in allowing people with different needs to access the games. So here's like an Xbox controller. You can see like there's like a thousand different buttons um, and they all have different um, functions. <clears throat> Another example of this is in Minecraft. And that is like a very, very versatile, accessible, um, control mapping because you can like change whatever button is doing what so you can like make the a button be left or maybe your hand usually likes to sit a little you know farther to the right so you can change that to that but yeah very very accessible design um this is a game called undertale so like this puzzle relies on players to listen to like a song and then they have to play back on a piano in order to unlock a room. It's a very complicated game. 
Um, but yeah, the creator of this game patched this puzzle, allowing for people to wait for the puzzle solution. So it was like, if you if you can't do it on your own the first try, like you'll get help and like it'll tell you what to do further down the line if you just wait. So it's like, it's not the end of the world if you don't know how to interact with this thing. And the design like accounts for that. <clears throat> Um, in a game called Celeste, they have like an assist mode. Um, it's like a platforming game known for like being really hard. Um, but they have like this assist mode that basically lets you like modify the rules to like make it easier for you. Um, and given that like it's really difficult um, and that's like kind of part of the storyline of the game, the creators still wanted to be intentional with adding a helpful mode. So it's not like only people who have really IQs can play this game, but anyone can. Um, and it's okay to get like a little assistance. But yeah, that's this like also like in terms of like, I don't know, marketing, it helps like, um, you know, market to more people and like allows for everyone to be able to play um, across different, you know, intelligence levels or stuff like that. <clears throat> yeah, here's like what the game looks like. So like the assist mode is like very direct in its intent and it allows you um, lost players of all abilities to still enjoy the same game. Um, yeah, this is like the menu and gameplay for assist mode once activated. Very interesting. <clears throat> also captions, I'm sure like you guys already know what captions are and like probably use them in a lot of your day-to-day -day life. Um, but like captions, subtitles, alternate audio, stuff like that. Everything that's like in that bottom right section of your screen where you're watching something um, is also like an act of uh, accessibility in, in design and it helps people who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, and like also other groups or other like contexts, like if you're in like a noisy room and you can't hear very well, you can like add captions to be able to, to know what's going on in your show or whatever. Personally, I always like need captions now um, or else, like, I feel like I just can't, like, understand words without seeing them. I don't know why. But, yeah, YouTube captions are really customizable. They have, like, um, uh, different options that you can change. You can change, like, the font, the color, the size, background, the background opacity, window color, character edge style, like, so many different things, but, um, there's just, like, in chores, for, like, there's, possibility for like everyone to enjoy it the way that they want to and the best way that works for them um yeah also like in iphone settings probably in most phones you can change like the display size and text size um my parents have like really really big text <laughs> and it's like unnecessarily large well for me at least so yeah but you know it uh accounts for everyone so universal design, what is this and how is it different? So universal design is like kind of a culmination of the principles um, of like usability, accessibility and inclusivity. Um, and it's like design that encompasses the needs of users to the greatest ability without like having to make other more accommodations, if that makes sense. So instead of like uh, designing during the process, it's more caring about like the end product um, and it stresses like these inclusive qualities in the end design. Um, so there's like seven principles of universal design and we will go over them. But yeah, it emphasizes the design of space and products that can be used by like as many people without needing to make like uh, multiple accommodations or like customizations, but like one design that like fits everyone. Um, yeah, emphasizes end result over process or intent. And it's usually applied to like an already built environment. Um, but yeah, these seven principles help people and designers create universal aspects in their design. So the first one is equitable use. Um, yeah, this first one is like kind of ensuring that something is um, like usable for a wide variety of people. So like, for example, we have Trader Joe's, the automatic sliding doors that are like on most uh, like stores and stuff are very convenient for like anybody, like whether you're walking, whether you're in a wheelchair or like have crutches, um, it opens for everyone. And yeah, this is like, 
it works for everyone, period. That's it. The second uh, principle is flexibility in use. So um, this focuses more on like accessibility and design specifically, um, accommodating for a wide range of abilities rather than like um, conditions, I guess. So for example, we have scissors. Most like scissors are right-handed and most people are right-handed. So I feel like um, a lot of people don't really think about it, but I'm sure left-handed people have the struggle of using scissors that are right-handed. Um, so yeah, like the creation of left-handed scissors uh, really like accommodates for like, I don't even know how much of the world is left-handed, but at least two people in this room are left-handed. Is anybody else? Okay, so like, that's like 25%. <laughs> that's a hella people. <laughs> but yeah, um, ha so like having the option of like choosing the scissor that works for your hand um, is like adds a lot more flexibility for use. The third principle is simple and intuitive use. So this ensures that design is like easy to understand um, regardless of skill level or language, abilities, any other kinds of barriers like that. And it really just emphasizes simplicity and consistency. So like we have a bunch of examples in everyday life, like escalators, like hopefully you understand if it's moving upward, like it's gonna take you up. So if you walk on it, you're gonna move up. And like, you don't have to understand any language to get that, hopefully. Um, and yeah, there's also like push to open doors. Okay, maybe there is some language involved in that, but if it's by a door and there's a button, you probably can like infer that it's gonna open the door. Um, and then like elevator buttons. Actually, now I'm thinking about it. Are numbers universal? Okay, but like for the most part, <laughs> people understand. <laughs> or like even just having like the higher numbers on the top, like if you're on like the first floor and you don't understand the numbers, but you want to go like two levels up, you just push like the second button, right? Okay, anyway. <laughs> yeah, so the fourth principle is perceptible information. And this like has to do with like the display of information and how you're presenting. Um, anything so yeah it should be like essential simple and displayed in multiple forms and these these can be like tactile visual verbal pictorial um so in these examples this is some japanese um tbh i don't really know what it is oh i think it's anybody know what these things are it looks like um okay well there's a language barrier here um but the fact is this that there's different colors there's a picture and words there's like in japanese characters and in romanized even though i don't actually know what it means um um but like the pictures for example like help you understand what the word is and so i can see like there's like a bug it looks like a firefly and like a flower and a mountain anyway um some other things like having braille on like keypads with numbers um accounts for like people who can't see very well and then yeah instructions these are like ikea instructions ikea instructions um they like don't have any words and <laughs> actually i think they're pretty hard to understand sometimes but like they try to make it so that anyone, regardless of language, can understand it just by the pictures. And I, I think you can like get the general idea. Like someone has these tools, like a hammer, a something, and a, a pencil. <laughs> and I'm like, this is what not to do. Don't crack it, but this is what you're supposed to do. And if you don't know, call IKEA. Makes sense, right? Okay. So that's perceptible information. Uh, the fifth principle is tolerance for error. Um, and this like addresses safety and easiness to use. Um, so yeah, it says like a design should be made in a way that minimizes room for error 
information and elements of a design should be displayed in a way that is intuitive, provides warnings and hazards if needed. So this is like, um, clearly in this picture, there's like a green arrow and then like a red like stop symbol. Um, so like, hopefully everyone understands that like the green on the right is like, okay, you should go this way, go forward. But the red thing is like, don't go this way. Um, and like, I think it's pretty hard to mess up that information. Or like even just this walkway, like it clearly shows like you're supposed to walk on the walkway and then like the curbs are there. So you're not supposed to cross them into like the green space. Um, so yeah, these things are like, there's not a lot of room for error because it's pretty simple to understand. Which is kind of reflected from like all the other principles we also talked about. Um, number six is low physical effort. So this like ensures that a design can be used effectively and comfortably with low physical effort, like not doing too much with your body. Um, and repetitive actions in strained amounts of physical effort should be avoided if possible. So here's an example of like a soap dispenser. Um, you don't have to like push a button or like pull anything. You just put your hand under and it comes out, which is like extremely low physical effort. Um, and yeah, there's like an example of someone in a wheelchair. They're trying to open a door and um, it's like, I think they're using something to like push the door open, but that's like, I feel like a lot of physical effort. So like something to fix this problem would be like, I don't know, a, a button to open the door or like an automatic door or nothing. But yeah. And lastly, the last uh, principle of universal design is size and space for approach and use. Um, and this kind of just says that like design should provide the appropriate size and space that's needed for like any user regardless of like ability or size or mobility. Um, and this like usually incorporates a lot of signage um, that like is easily accessible for different kinds of users and it allows like extra room um, for an assistive device like a wheelchair or allow for personal assistance. So here we have like a subway or like BART doors kind of. Um, there's like the regular ones that like people can just walk through, um, but then like they're too small for people like in wheelchairs. So they have like another set of doors that also works for that. And then on the bottom, TBH, I don't know what this is. There's some buttons with numbers on them. Oh, an elevator. You're right. <laughs> um, so you can like, if you can't reach high to like push a button, you can select the floor from like the floor. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those are like the seven principles of universal design. And like these are like some other like case studies. So if you didn't already know, which I think we already mentioned before, but the curb cut was actually invented in Berkeley. Like on like most sidewalk, every sidewalk you see, there's like, you know, like a little divot. So you can like roll onto the sidewalk. Um and that, that was actually invented here in Berkeley. So that's kind of crazy, guys. Yeah. Um, interesting picture. <clears throat> and then, like, another example is, like, the tactile museum pathways. This is at the Louvre. Um, but so they have, like, Braille in addition to, like, written text on these, um, like, panels. And this just, like, accounts for people who like are blind, they can't read or are just hard of seeing. Um, so they can still get the information that way. And there's also like audio um, descriptions it shows. So this kind of like accounts for everyone receiving the same information, but in different forms based on their accessibility. And then there's also this Toto Universal Design Lab in Japan. Um, they have like different, many different bathrooms and like, they've color coded there's like pictures in addition to words and like railings to make it easier to navigate so yeah lots of different forms of making it more accessible and universal for everyone um okay now we're gonna wrap up very short lecture today um with some announcements but before we do that the secret word is um Let's let's make it <laughs> um slayed. S like she slayed that. 
S L A Y E D. She slayed. You slayed. We all slayed. Berkeley slayed with the curb cups. All right. Yeah, lecture 10. Oh, that's funny. Okay, lecture 11. <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, so if you're listening on the recording, just choose lecture 11 in the attendance form since lecture 10 isn't there, but yeah. Um, yeah, so some announcements. Um, you do have lab 10, but there's no homework 10. Um, it's just like the midpoint uh, check-in for the final that's due next week. So yeah, work on your final projects and um, please go to your lab next week or message your TA if you can't. And then yeah, the midpoint check-in is due, sorry, not next Tuesday, next Thursday. Um, and that's on B courses. And then reminder, like if you haven't submitted your final proposal, please do that. So um, that is graded. Yeah. And I think that's it. But Thank you all for coming out to lecture and if you have like any questions about like finals or anything please reach out or like talk to me yeah. oh yeah no lecture next thursday but you do have lab yay